I know. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good, very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to do this with you. Yeah, it's great. It's a beautiful day here. It is. I, can't, I, I, want, I want to open my window, but there's jackhammering going on outside. Um, well, that is unfortunate. I was I was just outside for a lunch outdoors, and I can I can vouch for the, the, the weather. It's a good day. Um, so I wanted to start off talking a bit about race. There was a front page story in the Washington Post today about the sort of unreported, uh, previously unreported ways in which race had sort of burbled up in the campaign, uh, particularly as it related to the Obama side of the campaign. Right. And my colleague John Judas just wrote a cover story in the New Republic, where I'm a staff writer, right. um, about... Which I, just, which I just got to the end of. Which you just got to the end of, good. Uh, Boom, finished. Time to start playing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It, never too quick to turn around a, right. an opinion. Right. Um, and, uh, and so I guess the thesis of the Judas piece was that there are various... Um, Obama would have to overcome various psychological impediments to his candidacy, um, and namely the sort of subconscious ways in which a lot of Americans are still uncomfortable with black people, uh, even if they're not the, the norm against consciously or explicitly uh, using race as a factor in, in political decisions is, is sort of verboten. Um, and um, I, let me, maybe I should just ask what you thought of Judas's argument. Well, I, I, I thought it was a, I thought it was an interesting overview of kind of the state of the art of, of, of psychology, social psychology, political psychology, and race, and very uncertain exactly how Obama's going to fit into that, mm -hmm. because uh, I mean clearly there there are. There are racialized images that people have strong reactions to, like the undeserving black. I mean, welfare was a welfare was in fact in many ways a racial code. Mm -hmm. But when you could talk about, but people were happy to talk about welfare. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to talk about it purely in in in, in racial terms. Mm -hmm. Obama clearly doesn't. I mean, he's not a Jesse Jackson mm -hmm. type racial agitator. He doesn't fit into that uh, category. Uh, so, so I mean, I think I think the unanswered question in Judas's piece was was kind of what what box do people put him in? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is actually going to be, it's it's not the racism that reacts to the undeserving black poor. It's the racism that is uncomfortable with the black elite mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, right in many ways complicates the situation in my view because it's harder to box Obama as. He's not actually quite that convincing as angry, special pleading, mm -hmm. uh, urban demagogue, because he's not that. Right. Um, al although obviously he, 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 in a way that in a way it doesn't fit as well. It's the kind of the the the, the black yuppie. Now there's an interesting thing in the Judas piece about how, you know, when when black people are when black people are asking the question. In some of these social psychology uh, surveys, they they get very different answers, mm -hmm. and they get answers that indicate people are, are are less racist. In a sense, Obama is like the black person the asking the question. Yeah, I mean, you sort of have to express it to Obama. Yeah. So you know, you might you might feel like somebody like John Kerry is you know, or or, or, or Dukakis would sort of give away the would sort of not stand up to mm -hmm. the racial demagogues or you know, time take yourself back to the time of the L.A. riots, things like that. You might think that about Dukakis and react to it. You're less likely to react to it directly mm -hmm. to a black... You're not going to say to a black person at a party, you know those black people are, that are you right. know, making ridiculous demands. So I think it's... I mean, I think it's interesting, but a, but a very complicated story. And I have one, I have one other thing to say when we, mm -hmm. when we return. <laughs> um, After your... Thoughts. Yeah, no, I have. Uh, I had a similar reaction, which is Obama seems to me basically a sui generis figure, right. um, and so it's very difficult to extrapolate from these psychological experiments to how people would relate to and uh, how comfortable they would feel with Obama. For me, there there are a couple of factors that figure in. I mean, you you mentioned that Obama is sort of in, kind of sociologically the, the the poster child for meritocracy in a way. So I think he does cut against all of the the undeserving imagery that you know that uh, that black politicians have often evoked in the minds of, of suspicious or racist white people um, the other the other wrinkle that I think cuts against this is uh, Obama is clearly not you know just 
by virtue of his name and his biography, not a typical African American. And I think uh, even you know uh, less educated, um, culturally conservative. Uh, working class white people tend to feel much more comfortable with African immigrants than they do with African Americans. Um, I actually looked at this a bit in a piece that I did several years ago, and there's there's some sort of uh, sociological research uh, that, that that discusses this. And basically, um, when uh, when people, even people who are inclined to 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 look pretty critically at African Americans in in, in say a political context. Um, they, they do tend to give African immigrants the benefit of the doubt. They, they sort of conform to stereotypes that uh, Americans have about immigrants generally, which is that they're hardworking and, you know, they're, they're willing to lift themselves up by their bootstraps and they don't expect a handout. You know, they just want to come and provide for their families, their family people. Um, so I do think, um, you know, the, the sort of Muslim slander notwithstanding, that the name and the exotic biography actually counteracts this a bit. Um, in the, on the flip side, I, I do think that while you wouldn't think that Obama would be too susceptible to the old kind of special pleader charge, um, this National Journal ranking identifying him as the most liberal senator, which I think is flawed for any number of reasons, right. uh, is, is, is kind of preposterous. But it, you're gonna, you can bet you're going to see that <laughs> over and over and over right. in Republican ads. And I think being able to call this guy the most liberal you know, senator is is potentially going to reinforce that charge, where it would otherwise have been very difficult to to stick to him. Um, so I do think that's a potential risk. If he just you know more liberal than Bernie Sanders um, is is a tough thing to overcome, particularly when it when it kind of uh, dovetails with stereotypes that that tip, you know that a lot of voters have about African American politicians. So those are my my, my two. Right. No, I think that's I think that's right, and I think the more liberal, it's easier to say he's more liberal than whatever, than it is to actually pick a position right. he holds that you want to attack him right. on, um, which is really a remarkable position, I think, for uh, the, the, the Democrats are in. So it's, it's, it's how much hay can you make out of that, that word alone, you know, combined with whatever associations it might invoke based on, on people's race, that he in turn can't kind of transcend or, 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 or get around. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's interesting. Now, the, the, um, uh, the bit that uh, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm really kind of afraid of right now is I think that Michelle Obama does set off mm -hmm. some of these sparks. Mm -hmm. I think people have a I mean, I think she's a wonderful and fascinating person. My wife did a profile of her for, for O, the Oprah magazine, and you, you know, uh, but I, I think white people have there, there's a particular kind of experience of, for, for you know black women. You know, making it, which is a, which is a, you, you, you get that palpable sense that they were raised with that sense of you got to work mm -hmm. three times as hard, four times as hard, five times as hard to, you know, to, to get ahead in this world. And you're going to go to a place like Princeton, which mm -hmm. is not a comfortable place, uh, uh, to be as a black woman in the, you know, in the, in the, in the mid eighties. Um, it's a, it, there's a, there's a toughness, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and an intensity that I think a lot of white people, uh, can, can feel as uncomfortable. And you're starting to see these, um, you know these right-wing attacks on her as mm -hmm. a, as a uh, you know affirmative action baby and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. I think that that aspect could get a little ugly. Mm -hmm. And she and I mean, I mean Barack Obama is totally beyond classification mm -hmm. or type, uh, and, and unfortunately she's not. Right. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that. It's interesting that let, let, I want to jump ahead mm -hmm. of the things that we were going to talk about because um, you had. Uh, uh, you had written something a, a, f a few days ago opposing uh, McCain's idea of doing kind of unmoderated yeah. debates uh, between McCain and Obama, and uh, I have to just thinking of, just thinking about Obama at, just just in, in the conversation we just had mm -hmm. thinking about Obama as kind of the person the equivalent of the black question the person actually asking the question right. the person actually answering and speaking to whatever whatever issues they raise with it about him, like calling him the most liberal or whatever. Mm -hmm. It made, made me think that actually the unmoderated debate is a pretty interesting forum for, in which to be able to do that, mm -hmm. where you're not, you, you're not doing battle with, with um, you know, Charlie Gibson and, 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 right. and Stephanopoulos simultaneously, you're, and, and, and there are things that McCain can't say to him directly that would be, you know, like... Can't, I don't know what he's going to say about Bill Ayers mm -hmm. or whatever that the moderators reinforce. Um, so again, it seemed to me. I mean, I, you know, you're going to have some debates, 
And the idea of having some of them be unmoderated, uh, uh, different style of debates actually seemed pretty appealing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, again, I mean, I think a lot of this, or not again, but a lot of this obviously hinges on the details. You know, is it a complete uh, replacement for the standard three moderated debates? Is it a supplement? Is it going to be a series of weekly um, you know, appearances across the country right. between now and November. Right, which McCain kind of hinted which at. Which McCain kind of hinted at. So it's the details of this, this whole yeah. uh, this whole project sort of hinges on the details. But, you know, just for the sake of argument, say that there were a, a couple of, of these unmoderated debates and probably would entirely replace the, the regular debates. Um, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think it, it does give Obama a chance to kind of break out of whatever box that he might be put into. Um, you know, one, the same piece that I did where I looked at uh, how people respond to African immigrants, one of the interesting things, uh, ways in which uh, African-American politicians had overcome uh, prejudice and stereotypes was just by sheer uh, visibility and contact with voters. There was a, a somewhat famous this story about a congressman named Alan Wheat who uh, who won election to a majority white district in Missouri that he basically should not have, <laughs> have won in. Right. And right. Uh, Wheat actually consulted with a psychologist prior to running who told him that basically you just have to meet people and physically touch them. Uh, mm-hmm. It's very difficult for people to hate people that they personally and intimately interact with. So he he, went, he decided at the beginning of that campaign, his first campaign, that he was going to meet and shake hands with basically every person in the district. And I think he ended up shaking something like 3,000 hands a day or something ridiculous. I, I, th- right. That could be hyperbolic. But the idea was right. he spent every day, all day shaking That's hands. That's not a, a racial phenomenon. Um, not a racial phenomenon, yeah. no. But, but the, but the, the it seems to be uh, uh, more urgent for for to establish some sort of intimacy with voters. It seems to be more urgent for someone who faces large uh, stereotypes right. uh, potentially. And so I think you know this kind of this idea of an unmoderated debate where you see sort of unvarnished Obama. It's a little more intimate potentially. Is is probably a good thing, and it, and it, for the for a similar reason. Um, my, my concerns are sort of uh, more crass, I guess. I think Obama has a couple enormous uh, fundamental advantages. One is just the enthusiasm on the Democratic side. Two is um, the amount of money and therefore the amount of media attention and you know paid and unpaid that he'll be able to gin up. Uh, and, and and three is is that McCain, uh, you know, possibly as a result of the previous two things, is going to be tarred with Bush. Uh, Bush will just be, uh, you know, wrapped around his neck at every opportunity. Um, and I think you sacrifice all three of those things by doing too many of these unmoderated debates. If it starts to be sort of a, a regular feature of the campaign, you know, tune in next week for the next installment of a couple right. Obama and McCain, you know, this time right. in Idaho, um, I think right. you really do start to sacrifice some of these advantages, I think McCain is going to have a lot of trouble, you know, ginning up enthusiasm on the campaign trail. As a result, probably won't get as much media attention, free media, and and that's to say nothing of Obama's, earn, you know, paid media advantage, which I think is going to be significant. Right. Um, on top of which, I think meeting in this, having a sort of civil discussion, uh, which the sort of um, goo-goo idealist in me would like to encourage, um, as, a, as a matter of sort of brass tax strategy, I think it allows McCain to break out of this box of he's a right winger, he cozied up to the conservative base to win the nomination. He would basically be an extension of Bush's two terms in office. Suddenly you have this perfectly reasonable-looking, reasonable-sounding, open-minded guy right. having a civil discussion with Barack Obama, and you're thinking, well, maybe he's not such a crazy right-winger. He's not so irreconcilable. Um, we could actually do business with, guy, with this guy. He sounds pretty sane and likable yeah. to me. Um, right. That would be the concern, I guess. Right, I guess so. I mean, I don't think – I mean, the money – I mean, McCain will have plenty of money, um, there's a there's a and not to get into all the campaign finance sure. uh, baloney, but I mean unless he was in unless he was in a situation where he was forced to be in the public financing system for the primaries and then had the sort of the dark period where he couldn't right. do anything until the convention, which he's he'll he'll get out of that. Uh, he'll have plenty of money and there'll be plenty of other ways to uh, 
uh, of ways to him for him to spend money. There's a Brad Smith, who's a former mm-hmm. FEC commissioner, had a post on the on the blog Red State, uh, uh, actually a few, maybe well over a month ago, on all the different ways that they'll that they'll be able to move money through different, <laughs> their different right, things, right. even without getting into sure. FAF 27. Sure. So I'm not. I, I don't think. I mean, we will see McCain. And the, the side of McCain they present will be the McCain of the back of the bus, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the one that the reporters know that's that, that that's comfortable and seems affable and mm-hmm. not crazy and uh, uh, and 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 all that. Um, so I don't think you could shut that out just by refusing to debate. But of course you're right. I mean, you don't want to be doing this every week, and you don't want to be kind of let, letting sharing your spotlight with your opponent um, unnecessarily. Um, but I do think, I mean, it, it's interesting to think about. I think I, I've, I've felt through all the period where Obama didn't do fabulously in the in the, in the the however, however many right. hundred Democratic debates they were, he did fine, but you really look forward to, to getting him in that environment where it actually disagrees of it, where there's right. real disagreements, not, not disagreements about health care mandate or no mandate or, you know, um, what the, the precise conditions are right. which you'd meet with <laughs> with, a, right. with a with a with a dictator, but where, where, where you where you can really draw out those those distinctions. Right? But that's true. My, my only other concern, and, and we should move on quick because this yeah, is. Yeah, but but yeah. is Obama is sort of a conciliator by disposition, and so you yeah. can imagine him being, you know, uh, you know, his his advisors and strategists sort of, you know, really pumping him up to go and and kind of nail this guy on right. several right. across several different dimensions on several different policy positions, and then Obama kind of by instinct going out and sort of groping for common ground with McCain, you know, which which would would sort of muddle the message. Right. Right. Although that's assuming less political skill than he's Yeah, shown. no, that's that's right. It's, that's um, right. I, I don't. I, you you can definitely sell this guy short. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So um, you know, let, let's maybe move in the other direction. Yeah. We were going to do the the ta- take on the unity idea of a unity right. ticket before this, but right. but uh, is, in your words, uh, from from one potential gimmick to the next, um, right, what's exactly. what's your yeah. arguments uh, against a unity ticket? Well, I, I you know, your fine magazine asked a number of people to comment on this idea. Uh, at the end of last week, so I, I wrote something up. It was interesting. They, they asked to, on the question of whether you should have a African American and a woman paired on a unity ticket. They managed to ask five white uh-huh. men uh, to comment, but I was pr- pr- proud to be one of them. <laughs> and I mean, I, I basically think I think my argument is that the, the the divisions in the Democratic Party are not actually that deep as a result of this of this rate. I mean, in other words, people split along distinct demographic lines. But that doesn't mean that there's a profound split that the candidates represent the way Kennedy and Carter did in 1980 mm-hmm. or the way, you know, McGovern and the establishment did in 1972 or something like that. You take the candidates out of the way and you wouldn't even really see the, right. the split. It happens, yes, older women are going to vote for, for, for Hillary Clinton. Uh, African Americans are going to vote for Barack Obama. Um, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of things there we don't and people might you know in the heat of the moment people say oh I might not support that that person in the fall and most of them will so um, I, I I don't think it's essential to have the unity ticket to to, to to heal some split I think you know I think in three months we'll look back and we'll you know it'll all be like tr- political trivia mm-hmm. questions like yeah well, who was it who called Hillary Clinton a monster mm-hmm. and why was that a big deal and we'll kind of be amazed at how at, at how at, at how intensely involved we were in these questions so it's just a matter of looking at Hillary at, 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 at Senator Clinton the way you would look at any matchup for 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 Obama obviously somebody with more experience would be good would be a good match I wouldn't put him you know I wouldn't go for somebody like you know uh, uh, Tim Kaine of Virginia, mm-hmm. somebody you know, fairly new governor, um, somebody with experience as a governor uh, uh, or longer term in the Senate would be great. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton. Actually, you fall on that on that issue that the experience is still kind of ambiguous. Yeah. I mean, what what? How do we score uh, living in the White House? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and so she has, obviously has a few more years in the Senate than he does. She has military. Uh, she sort of immersed herself in the Armed Services Committee. No question about it. But there's a lot of people with, with good experience. I mean, somebody like Evan Bayh is only yeah. 52 years old, and he's been in office for he was first elected Secretary of State yeah. in in, uh, in 1988, yeah. um, or or Biden or somebody like that. And then you've got uh, you know you've got other people who kind of represent a different type. I mean, actually, I think in some ways Obama and Clinton are more alike than they are different yeah. in the type of politician and person they are. I mean, you know, she's from Chicago, yeah. he's from Chicago. They kind of come from that upper Midwest yeah. reformist tradition in many ways. Um, 
and uh, and you know you look for somebody a little different. You might look at somebody like Jack Reed from Rhode Island, or obviously, I mean, lots of people love Jim Webb. I'm a little right. dubious about Jim Webb, but he's definitely a different type of yes. dude. No question about that. Um, so uh, that I mean, it's not like a it's not like a vehement don't go their reaction to the unity ticket, but I, I just don't really see it as anything that's necessarily important. Obviously, and it's obviously important that the that the president and vice president be able to be able to mesh around a single campaign and around governing, which means they have to trust each other to some extent. I, you know, mm-hmm. that seems to be lacking at the moment. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way you do. I guess I think um, I don't think that these wounds are so deep that they can't be mended. Uh, and I and I feel actually pretty confident that they will be. So I think if you're looking to a unity ticket to accomplish that, you're probably uh, the rationale is wrong because I agree with you. I think right. that's going to happen anyway. I agree with your mode of analysis that she should be evaluated the same way uh, any other potential V should should be evaluated. And I actually think uh, when you do that analysis, I, I feel even more strongly than you do. I think that she should not be the, <laughs> the she should not be on the ticket. And it's really for two reasons. One is and and you alluded to this in your post on the subject I think Iraq just her position on Iraq totally muddles his message of being sort of pure on the issue Um, I think it's going to be you know he's going to if it's an election about national security generally he's got real problems but if the national security discussion is based on Iraq um, he's going to do very well and she would just muddle that message in in various ways that I think he can't afford I think he needs a real clean hit on Iraq now, does that exclude somebody like Evan Bay as well in your in your? Yeah, view? you know, I, I think uh, we actually had this conversation just around the office uh, a, a couple of days ago. I, I think it, it, it does get tricky. I mean, you know, obviously there wasn't this sort of high profile, you know, um, hand wringing uh, as there was with Hillary. So, it, uh, you know, I think at this point, you know, one of Hillary's, you know, obviously she's she's moderated her position considerably, but. Still, one of her main um, a main element of her political identity over the last two years has been her refusal to to repudiate her position. I mean, she got close at various points, but never actually did. And I think the the kind of ongoing soap opera of you know did she repudiate or did she not or it's, it's such a sort of preoccupation when you think about Hillary that I, I think it's particularly debilitating um, in her case. I, I, yeah, clearly it would it would muddle the message with with other people, um, but I, 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 I think you know it, it, she is sort of a singularly problematic case um, that I think some of the others would, would not be. Um, for me, the second problem that she pre- she presents is um, I think it's it's obvious that she's done very well among working class Democrats in these primaries, but it's not at all clear to me that she would do well with working class non Democrats. In fact, yeah, yeah. I think she may very well do worse than Obama <laughs> with working class non Democrats right. um, because. Uh, I think there's just a huge difference between uh, working class voters who vote in Democratic primaries and those who don't. And those who don't may be among the people who demonize her the most um, Mm -hmm. in American politics. Um, So I think she not only could she not if she end up not helping Obama among that demographic, she could actually hurt him among that demographic. You'd have a certain element of, the, of that group who didn't vote for him because they were uncomfortable, say, with, with race. And then on top of that, you may bring a whole new demogra- sub-demographic of people who are uncomfortable with Hillary. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you yeah. may end up getting the worst of all right, worlds there, right, right. Um, which I think is really a, a real risk. Yeah, no, the idea of, of, of Hillary Clinton as working-class hero is quite a quite a... A stretch. You know, it's 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 fascinating. There's a fascinating little thing that it's it's also it's it's regional. It's not completely true that Obama doesn't do well with, mm-hmm. with working right. class people or with rural people or whatever. I mean, obviously, he does well with working class African Americans, right. but there are plenty of states where he's done fine with working class right. with working class whites as well. Where he doesn't do well is in that strip right. of you know, basically from West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Ohio, right. which we worry about obviously is, right. is very significant in the general election, and and Southern Pennsylvania, that kind of Appalachian strip. And there's, have you been reading the blog um, 538.com? I, I know that, that? It, that's Poblano, Poblano from Coast. I've, I've dipped awesome. in and out of there. Yeah, it's, absolutely yeah. awesome uh, statistical stuff. And he found this thing the other day that uh, uh, he's, he looked at the census and there's uh, about seven percent of people refuse to answer any question about their ethnic background mm-hmm. in the census, 
and instead they write in American. Huh, that's and those people are are totally constant. He 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 pulled, put up a, a map of this, uh, of, of of where you, you know where you see more of that writing in American, and they're just disproportionately located just in that very same mm-hmm. in that very same strip, the sort of defiant American identification. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is obviously related to race. I mean, it's also yeah. possibly. I mean, they treat it as it's sort of a stubborn, you know, right. refused to stubborn. express. It may actually be true. I mean, there are people who don't have any sense of what their ethnic right. background is, right, right. you know, um, right. because their families have been here for a long time and they don't do a lot of you know self examination right. of it, and they're not in the uh, in the clubs or, or, or whatever. Um, so that's why, I, 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 yeah, exactly. I think that there's there are, there there is a particular group that that the Clintons of Arkansas had an ability to connect mm-hmm. to. Bill Clinton in particular had an ability right. to connect to that Kerry Gore and Obama may not. You know, it was another funny thing in John Judas's piece here. He sort of referred to people Obama can't connect to, and uh, the same people Gore and Kerry couldn't connect to. And it's like Obama, Kerry, and Gore are three completely different right. politicians. It's, right. it's not like it's not like they're all the same right. type. You know, right. one's from Tennessee, one's from Massachusetts, one black. I mean, it's a very funny way of, of lumping all those three together. It's just those are people. They're not voting for Democrats anymore. Right. That's right. Um, that's right. So that's right. That, yes. That's right. No, I, I think the idea that Hillary would do better than say Gore among that. Yeah. Group is, is is fairly far fetched. I, yeah. right. I think that's right. Um, so should we move on to this this piece that my colleague my colleague to keep the TNR theme? Yeah, I'm, I'm love it. You know, it's a, it's a it's a week where all the good stuff has been in TNR. That's right. Um, that's right. Since the only thing I produced in the last week was in TNR. That's <laughs> so. right. Well, we like to think every week is such a week, but <laughs> right. but maybe that's not always the case. Not always the case. Um, well, there have been such weeks. But in, okay, so this this piece that yeah, actually yeah. Michael Michael Crowley is in the office right next door to me right now. Um, and so Michael I, Crowley, I've known since he was ten years old. That's right. That's right. I know that you're long time <laughs> family friends. Um, yeah. So uh, Mike wrote this piece basically saying that the kind of um, psychological uh, what would keep Hillary going at this point in the primary is some of the same things that sort of powered her through uh, emotionally and psychologically through impeachment and that the, right. the sort of uh, emotional posture is, is is very similar, and it, it kind of manifests itself in some very similar ways. Right, a kind of anti elitist populism. You know, he talked about that uh, that Sally Quinn article mm-hmm. in the Washington Post in 1997 or 98, where it was who was, I can't remember who was quoted as saying, you know, they came to this town and they trashed right. it. It's not their town right. to be representing this sort of uh, elitist. Uh, uh, attitude. I thought that was a very. I mean, I thought it was a very good piece, and I, 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 just the night before I read it, been thinking something similar. But, but I was thinking of it in somewhat different terms, which is that the, that the impeachment period led to the sort of closing of the circle. Right. You know, uh, uh, where where you only trust the people closest in, which has actually been the most debilitating thing. Right. To Clinton, if you look at, you know, um, a few weeks ago, people started looking at at. Uh, at, at clips of the war room, you know, mm-hmm. because there was that controversy right. about whether um, Indiana about Indiana, yeah. whatever. You know, what, again, one of those things that in three weeks we'll be like, right. what was that about? But seemed incredibly important for about three hours. Um, you know, you think about the war room and you remind it. You know, here's Clinton in '92, surrounded by all these people he doesn't really know very mm-hmm. well. You know, he doesn't know Stan. Right. Well, he doesn't know Ste- uh, Stephanopoulos hardly at all, right. and you know, primary colors captured some of that sense too. And yet, they're able to—they've all got these different skills, and they are actually able to to create out of chaos something that's a that's a, that's a winning campaign. You know, Hillary Clinton's instincts for that are different, mm-hmm. and then impeachment, I think, sort of toughens her up so that you know, here's Mark Penn. He was with us. He got us through that right. period. You know, I'm trusting nobody else but right. him. And then this very close circle. Again, TNR. I'm mean, Chuck Cottle's done the best right. reporting about this. Um, you get this sense of uh, that. That's and that's where you know that feedback where nobody's kind of reaching out, bringing in a different experience, uh, some something something different, very similar. Um, I read a piece about Gordon Brown, mm-hmm. uh, who's you know have you know basically collapsing mm-hmm. as the uh, as, as the UK Prime Minister has a very similar setup, and and uh, the piece I read, which was in um, I guess in the London Review of Books, uh, talked about how everybody around him 
owes their career to him, uh-huh. so they can't sort of right. so that they, they don't challenge him enough. They don't bring in outside information enough. And it seemed to me that impeachment created that that very situation with uh, with Clinton. Whereas Obama is sort of like Clinton in '92. Yeah. I mean, he's like Clinton in '92 in many respects. But one is he's got these people working on his campaign who are not. Yeah. His, they're they're not people that he spent the yeah. last five years surrounded by. They're people he doesn't know that well, and it's, it's a fascinating way to yeah. uh, way to do about it. And they're also not the typical. I mean, the third model is like what I think John Edwards did a little more of, which is the right. the kind of Bob Shrum right. thing, where you where some consultants come in and give you the same campaign that they gave right. somebody else right. four years earlier. Right. Um, yeah, um, no, I had I had some similar thoughts. I mean, one thought that you sort of brushed up against, which occurred to me while I was reading it, was maybe it's a mistake to talk about the Clintons uh, as though they were similar politicians. I right, mean, obviously, right, right. you know, they've learned a lot from one another and borrowed a lot mm-hmm. from one another. I think more she from him, but he's obviously she's a very bright woman, and mm-hmm. he's learned in, and she's had good advice to him over the years. But but I, I think you know my sense is that. Um, you know, Hillary always had a somewhat more of a tendency to close the circle, to be suspicious of outsiders, to prize loyalty. Um, right. So much so that um, that uh, I actually reviewed this book, The Way to Win, by, by Mark Halpern and, and John Harris. Right. And, you know, they have, uh, for those who don't know, they, they posit this idea of a freak show that modern campaigns um, have to deal with the, the blogosphere, the internet, Matt Drudge, right, right, and right. only those campaigns... Freaks all of us. Exactly. <laughs> um, right. Guilty as charged, I guess. And only those campaigns that are capable of sort of somehow um, surviving the freak show will will end up prevailing. And, obviously, you know, the Bush people in 2004... And, and, and 2000 and 2004 learned to manage the freak show in a way that Al Gore and John Kerry didn't. And they argued that, you know, in, in 2000 and 2006, Hillary uh, and her team learned how to grapple with and often triumph over the freak show. And, and, and the, the subtle sort of implication, or not so subtle implication, was that she would uh, be better um, in a presidential, too, because they, the, the, the people around her knew this freak show environment and had learned to survive and even flourish in it. And I got to thinking you know that they made a lot of persuasive points one of which is was the ways in which she and the bush cheney people were similar you know there was a similar right. sensibility yeah. Yeah. um they p- really prized loyalty the you know um they didn't do well with with people from the outside uh, offering advice and and you know or even you know certainly not speaking on their behalf um, you know they were ruthless often toward opponents um, you know they they give this example of uh, of during the during the uh, 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 during Hillary's 2006 run for president, where she, um, these these slew of Hillary biographies were coming out uh, with sometimes embarrassing revelations. Most of them small bore, but still somewhat embarrassing. And th- these guys would be all over it, you know, just just kind of uh, demonizing opponents and stifling dissent. And it was very Bushian and Cheney-like and Rove-like. And I get the sense that Hillary, there's been an element of that um, with Hillary from day one. And I think, you know, certainly if you look at healthcare in the first go around, and there's this famous story with Jim Cooper of Tennessee, who she basically, you know, the accounts vary, but really sort of took after for proposing sort of right. a, an alternative to her plan. Um, you know, even earlier... Accounts do vary because there's a lot of people that, who see Jim Cooper as a very nefarious actor. That, that's right. That's that right. Period. That's right. Though I think yeah. if you would suggest... I'm neutral. I'm neutral on this. Right. I, I think few would suggest that Hillary was the most open and inviting and conciliatory <laughs> right, right. during that process. So I, I think you've seen it over the years, and I think impeachment kind of reinforced that with her, but it didn't It didn't create it. Uh, whereas Bill, you know, was always a little more uh, a little more chaotic, yes, but sort of right. open. The circle was wider. Um, he, he liked the kind of uh, free, you know, kind of, you know, free-ranging debates. And, right. and, and so I think um, th- that th- th- you have to kind of distinguish Distinguished between the, the, the styles of the two of them, and you can't just talk about a sort of Clinton brand that was forged during impeachment and kind of persists to this day. Right, right. The, the other thing, absolutely. I mean, they always use their respective strengths right. 
in partnership really well, but it really matters what's at the top. You know, that's right. That's it's always right. I always thought of them as, as sort of like if you if you were working for an organization and you you know you're picking a new CEO, you could, or editor of your magazine or whatever, you could have somebody who's pure inspiration, but right. you know, kind of crazy and messy. Okay. And you put somebody underneath them who kind of makes keeps the, the, the managing time. editor really great. Right. You if you have a choice, you'd rather have that on top and the right. and the discipline below right. than the discipline on top. And the inspiration right. from you know you're not right. you can't you can't sort of inspire upwards right um, right and and in a sense that's what the campaigns do you were what what you were going to make one other yeah point. one other small point in um and, and that is you know Mike makes a point of how Hillary having served on the on the on the Watergate committee actually uh, as a young lawyer um uh was um was so well versed in the rules of impeachment that she could really kind of uh anticipate where the republicans were overreaching and where they were running afoul of the rules and overstepping and that was uh, incredibly valuable i think to the clintons during impeachment the, the you know that was almost the opposite of the case this time around where going in a lot of us thought that the clintons having been through this twice would have known the the procedural rules backwards and yeah, forwards. Yeah, in right. fact, they were singularly incompetent at right. mastering the right. procedural rules, and you know, obviously, it, it blew up in their face. And it was the Obama team, the upstart, yeah. um, you know, the Republicans yeah. in the in the analogy, who right. really mastered the rules and exploited them very right. effectively. Right. Ben Smith has a great profile of the guy who's mm-hmm. like the delegate strategist right. and who understood Jeff Berman, the dif- yeah. yeah, the difference between districts that had an odd number of delegates right. and the di- districts that had an even number because you're probably going to split the even That's number right. uh, districts. Just amazing, uh, amazing skill that they've applied that they applied to, to to all of these questions. You know, I can't help but feel. You know, I think it was probably it was probably two years ago. I had lunch with somebody who's you know a pretty respected Democratic uh, uh, strategist uh, guy. Who, and, 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 and I said what I often say, which is, you know, I think anybody who's been around the track of running for president has an advantage over anybody mm-hmm. who doesn't. I mean, kind of total, totally vain right. observation. And, the, and this guy said, you know, but the thing is, the Clintons think they've been around the track, right. but they haven't been around right. it since 1996. Right. Right. And, you know, in a sense, what you, when you talk about the freak show, the freak show that they think they survived right. is actually different. That's right. And the conditions are different. One of the conditions that t- that's different, of course, I mean, they were sort of on their own in that period. Yeah. I mean, there was kind of nothing. Move on actually emerged right. as, is anybody going to defend this guy? Is anybody right. going to sort of make a statement of, of, of common sense? And, and since then, you know, this whole universe has developed to sort of that's, that's beyond the candidates. That's right. That, 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 that's pushing ideas and makes and, and it's just amazing how alone they were. That's right. Uh, dur- during that period, they were you know nobody in Congress wanted to do anything right. for them. Totally different situation now, which is why I mean you've re- we've both uh, uh, written a fair amount about about this issue of the inside outside structures, mm-hmm. what makes a party. And Matt Stoller had a piece in Open Left. Uh, at the end of last week, they got a little bit of attention, where, which was basically kind of ambivalent, yeah. right? About saying, you know, here's Obama; he's done all these cool. In, in the way that a lot of the net roots people are right. sort of ambivalent about about Obama, they're saying he's doing, in effect, he's doing some of the same things we were doing, like we we being the larger right. grassroots uh, uh, liberal uh, community, you know, trying to register a lot of voters, trying to engage lots of young people through the internet. Well, that's, he's doing all those things, but he's doing it all in his name. And what we're going to wind up with is instead of a broad progressive infrastructure, we're going to wind up with an Obama infrastructure. And is that good or is that bad? Right. Um, and I, you know, I understand the. I, I think I'm a little more blood. He, I mean, Matt was sort was in a sense accusing Obama of kind of cutting off right. some of the some of the infrastructure, like with the attacks on women's voices, right. women's vote, for example, which. Which I'd always thought to be a pretty cool and effective uh, right. organization, or you know, it, a lot of this was also at the level of rumor, right. like they were discouraging people right. from contributing to America Vote, right. Right, you know, which is another good um, right. uh, organization. I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but uh, if it's not true, then yeah, I mean, these things can coexist, but it's a. Con- I mean, I understand the ambivalence. I guess. What was your? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I, I was somewhat ambivalent, too. They're probably slightly more sympathetic to the Obama campaign than he was, or to the Obama movement, I guess. Right. Um, you know, I think, 
Um, the energy of the blogosphere and the 527s and all of the, the progressive money that's out there has certainly been a plus for the party. There's no question about that. But I do think that at a certain point, if a movement is ultimately going to you know, be an effective political force, that, that chaos doesn't serve it super well, <laughs> and that at some point it needs to be harnessed. And, you know, there are better ways and worse ways to harness it, but I think generally harnessing is a good is a step in the right direction. Um, and the army, I think, is that even, you know, um, e- you know, I've always thought that the coasts and people like him were... Um, we're kind of of two minds about that. I mean, they, they want, they like the energy and they like the cast, but they also wanted it to be sort of whipped into an effective fighting force. And they, right. they probably liked hierarchy a little more than they let on. You know? right. Um, right. They thought, you know, that, that you know, they, 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 they would prefer a hierarchy in which they were more influential rather than less influential. But hierarchy in itself wasn't a bad thing, despite the sort of blogosphere talking points about, you know, uh, open source and that sort of thing. Right. So I, I do think that, it, well, I think people feel differently about it. I mean, I think, yeah, I think we sometimes t- people t- talk about it's true. Marco as right. if he wants to be the leader of a movement. I, right. I think of him; he's a guy who created a big website right. in which lots of people do their stuff. That's right, and he's an interesting guy, but he's not. You know, that's right, and right. Um, the blogosphere is by no means yeah. monolithic in, in any along any dimension, but certainly not this one. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, I do think um, I do think a little hierarchy and and uh, or you know, and kind of a stiffer organization, even if it's at the loss of of, of a little more kind of creative energy bubbling up is not altogether a bad thing. Now, you know, we may have this conversation in two years when, you know, Obama's been in office for a year and a half, and suddenly we're seeing all these, you know, this overreaching and mistakes that are being made because there aren't these sort of countervailing forces, and the Obama people are just sort of are allowed to kind of do their thing without anyone checking them, in which case it would certainly be a a bad thing. Um, But at the level of of, of campaigning and even um, sort of uh, uh, you know acting as a force for kind of uh, reformist legislation, I think more organization and more centralized organization is probably uh, on balance a good thing. Right. Well, I mean, a campaign can't. I mean, a campaign has to have some of that. Right. I mean, the, the the counterpart to that would be like the Ned Lamont campaign, That's right. That's which right. was just kind of like, or even the Dean campaign, or even the Dean campaign. All this stuff comes in, and then the candidate gets on top right. of it and rides it wherever it's going, right. um, to, except when it when it all uh, runs in different directions. I think that's right. I actually look at it totally differently. I, I think that a lot of the infrastructure that that that's being built, what what happened to it was that it was. It was meant to be sort of infrastructure for good policies, infrastructure for a strong underlying party or cohesive progressive movement, doing things like registering voters and things like that. Um, and it, you know, you think of you, you, you see this under when you when you see some of the donors, mm-hmm. uh, the big, you know, the, the kind of people Matt Bly wrote about. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they they had a revelation in two thousand four of. Oh, we got to do more than just give campaign right. money to right. John Kerry. There's more to life than that. Uh, and so they so they fund CAP or right. they fund America Votes or right. Women's Voices, Women's Vote or whatever. But when it comes right down to it, they think they're just funding campaign operations. Right. Right. And and actually those things do bleed over right. into becoming campaign operations. Right. And w- Obama, by having more than enough money, more than enough, you know, Human capital, <laughs> you know, right. people willing to to, to, to work for him, uh, enormous ability to open, to, you know, to expand the electorate and things like that, all within his own campaign, right. kind of does that. And then those other organizations can go and do what they're supposed right. to do. I mean, I kind of have a render unto Caesar approach right. to this. It's very good for campaigns to be controlled by the candidate, but it's also right. very, very good for there to be a movement that's external. To the campaigns. I mean, this is what people talk about. At the, at, this is sort of the the smartest right. insight about the conservative right. movement was that it actually created lots of stuff that was not just right. a machine to elect Republicans. That's right. And in fact, was sometimes had had an ambivalent relationship with the Republican Party, but was supportive right. of conservative policies in, in in Reagan or something. So I think the I mean, I think it's like a great moment right. for the Net Roots and these other organizations to go out and say, you know what, we can build something. We don't have to think of our job as being elect Barack Obama, because he can take care of that right. with his own institutions. I mean, it's not like they're going to make these things go away. Now, if, if Matt sort of, if the rumor side of it is true, 
then in a sense, Obama, if it's true that Obama is in a sense c cutting those right. other progressive right. forces off because he views them as competitive or something like that, I think that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. But if you view them as complementary, it's it's great. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think, the, you know, the the lesson to draw from the conservative, the, the success of the conservative movement, at least in, in Washington on the level of ideas such as they are, right. is that, you know, they there were a lot of these conservative philanthropists who didn't want an immediate return on their money. And so these organizations were allowed to have an incredibly long time horizon, and it was the length of that time horizon which ultimately made them effective over a period of decades. And I think you're right that there was always this sort of central tension where people like Soros and other wealthy uh, Democratic-leaning philanthropists wanted to do both at the same time. They wanted, right. you know, they wanted to give these organizations uh, this this thirty-year-long time horizon and let them kind of subtly tilt the landscape over a period of years toward democratic and progressive ideas. On the other hand, they wanted them to elect John Kerry in two thousand and four, right. right. and there was always this very strong tension there. And I think they ended up probably doing neither as well as they could have had they just chosen one or the other. And you're right. I mean, I right. think this. I mean, I would exempt George from that a little right. bit because I worked for his foundation. So. <laughs> said that a little bit, but but yes, in general, I think that's right. Um, and I think it, it, you're right to, to the extent that you, you get rid of that tension and you clarify the roles is is probably not a bad thing. And and I do think that you know that having this long time horizon, um, which you know even if Obama, if Obama were president, his time horizon would be sort of eight years, uh, which would kind of pale in comparison to the sort of thirty years that you know that it, it, you know it, in the in the 70s when conservatives, in you know, late 60s, early 70s, when conservatives first started thinking about it, they, they thought of it as a sort of generational project in many respects. Uh, I guess there was that famous Powell memo. Um, oh, the Powell, you know, that's a total lie. It is a total lie. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's like the, the that's the slideshow. It's the rosebud of show the, for yeah. the for the yeah, it is right. the rosebud, and it's a, it's a really I mean the memo was not known to a lot of people. Right. It may have had some influence on the starting of the right. of the Heritage Foundation. Right. I wrote about this in uh, in the Prospect a few years ago, but it really was a forgotten thing. And then somebody discovered it and said, "Oh, here's right. the secret formula." But it yeah. wasn't even the formula for anything that got created. Right. It said. To the, it said to the Chamber of Commerce right. that the Chamber of Commerce should do a bunch of things, right. which they didn't do. <laughs> you know, right. the Chamber of Commerce wasn't very political uh, until until the nineties, and uh, and and, by, and Lewis Powell was not particularly. He's not certainly not a movement conservative, right? Uh, so anyway, that's, that's right. No, I little, guess I mean that's one of my little bugaboos. I mean, there was a lot more chaos on the right. I mean, the the, the bigger story is that. Often we tell the story of the right as they planned this thing. They said thirty years. Right. There was a lot of chaos. You know, the Heritage Foundation itself is the product of you know five or six false right. starts. Right. Right. There's a great new book by Steve Tellis, uh, T E L yes, uh, called The Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement that captures mm -hmm. the sense of even the even the leak law and economics, right. all these things we think of as huge. You know, there were there were huge things would get started, they would fall right. apart, they would start at one university, they, nobody would be interested, it would move somewhere else before they kind of took hold. But there was a kind of patience on the part of funders right, exactly. and uh, betting on people and they were not they under they had no sense that their goal was elect Republicans. That's right. That That's was right. not That's what right. they were doing. They were doing something completely different. And I think that uh, I think that as the net root side, as, as I think as we get more and more of this other side that can say, you know, the electing Democrats is a sphere over here that can take care of right. itself, which you know Republicans could take care of themselves. We're, we're doing something else, which is make making good policies possible. That's when it be, really begins to. Right. To come together. Yeah, and I, I guess I think one of the, you know, just to get back to this sort of temptation that these funders have always had, I, I think one of the problems was the Democrats were always kind of pretty close. You know? right. oh, they yeah, were yeah, just, they could right. just that's look right. just yeah. across yeah. the, the, law, the yeah. lawn over to the next right. yard and see it. Right. Whereas when a lot of these conservative philanthropists were ponying up, it, it looked so far away that yeah, you, yeah. you couldn't, you know, no sane person would expect a return very right. quickly. So in, right. in some cases, the long time horizon was not a matter of yeah. a prudent decision. It was just you would be nuts if you expected right. anything else. Which is which is really really the democratic recovery takes off. I mean, right. partly it's related to the war, but it takes off after the 2002 election. Right, right. And exactly. you just you know when it's the you know the equivalent of living in your car. Right, that's right. Um, and uh, you know it's actually if the if the Republican Party kind of hits bottom, 
next year. You know, right. loses a bunch of Senate seats, loses a bunch of congressional seats, loses Vito Facella's seat right. in Staten Island and so forth. You know, Somebody that's knows. actually when you could begin to see a real a real kind of recovery. Uh, you know, uh, an intellectual and uh, a kind of rejuvenation because they're not about holding on to President Bush or right. holding on to these Senate seats or anything anymore. They're they're back at, at square one the way they were in 1978. Right, and you know, I think we're almost out of time, but this raises an interesting question of whether it's better for Republicans and conservatives to lose <laughs> this right, year right, right. than than for John McCain to win and no one right. being completely happy, right. but it basically being a pretty static for eight right. years and and them have been no better off at the end of it than when they started. Right, exactly. Well, I have that. That is the topic well, of, of my cover story in the American Prospect next. Okay, week. terrific. Well, we will. I will look we forward to that. Uh, we can't break the embargo. Good. There. Well, we've just <laughs> we've just wet people's appetites, and maybe that's a good <laughs> note to end on. And we mentioned some publication other, other than, than the New Republic. Republic. That's, I'm told. That's I'm good. told that they exist. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not convinced of it, but I'm told that there are others. Yeah, I think there's something called Sports Illustrated. That's right, yeah. I don't know what that's all about. Not many people read it. All right. Terrific. Well, Great I night. enjoyed it. Thanks.